You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 82, just a tad more ortho, with Rebecca Bacow from Spear Education. This week, John and I sat down with Rebecca Bacow to discuss how to develop a airway team to help treat our sleep disordered patients. Now, it's interesting what she came up with. She has a certain system or protocol in her practice that she is developing. But where can you go to take your team and learn this protocol? We discuss what's the future of orthodontic education and what should we be doing for our patients right now in our practice this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Nashville in 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com now to sign up. That's RestorativeDrivenImplants.com. And welcome to this episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. Wes, it is the new year. Happy New Year! Happy New Year! (laughs) Yeah, we are dropping this episode. John, where are you at right now? Where am I at right now? I mean, really, are you in your studio? I know you're in your studio. Yeah. But literally on the first, in reality... Yeah. So Did you I jump guess across somewhere? Since, Did you jump? Since you are letting the cat out of the bag. <laughs> because I'm not in my hometown either. Yeah. So where I actually am right now, when you're listening to this, is I'm uh-huh. in jolly old England. Oh my. Jolly old. Say hello to the bro. Having a, yeah, having a spot of tea. And uh, I don't know, man. New Year's in England, in London. Oh, I've man. never, I mean, it's going to be epic. So... Yeah, it's already I've already been where I am now. I will I've already been in the following in the next day for several hours before you beat us. You beat us to 2019. Right. Because, you know, the colonies, otherwise known as the U.S., you know, they're still (laughs) it's still in the uh, still not quite there when they're they're not ready for the stupid ball to drop, you know, over here in jolly old England. So, yeah, I'm really excited about that trip. Not only am I going to get to be there for New Year's. But maybe more importantly for me as a soccer fan, I'm going to get to go see Chelsea play really? at their home stadium. Now, I'm not necessarily a Chelsea fan. So if any of you are soccer people, I'm more of a Bayern Munich fan. So not that you care. but I don't. I don't care. I know you don't care. <laughs> and that's totally fine. But, but Chelsea is, of course, one of the, the greatest names in, in Premier League history. And to get to go to Stamford Bridge and see them play is going to be... That's going to be pretty sweet. Epic. Yeah. So I'm pretty excited. Hoping no beer gets thrown on my kids. Or anything mm-hmm. crazy like that. They do get a little, you know, they're known for their hooliganism. Mm-hmm. But we're sitting in the family friendly section, which means there will probably be at least a few less f bombs dropped, you know, within right. shouting distance. But anyway, so yeah, New Year's is here, and you know, with New Year's West comes one of the great questions in dental practice if you're an owner, which is, how do I deal with my fees? In the new year, right? Because no, I need to lower them, John. We need to lower them. People aren't coming <laughs> into my practice. Yeah, I need I'm more drop, patients, I'm so I'm going to drop my fees 10%, right? Yeah, I got That's, cheaper crowns this year. I'm actually moving on to a different lab. and Right, I've lo- used six labs in the last six weeks. Yeah, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to actually lower the price of my, my crowns, <laughs> man. Yeah. I, yep. I've lowered, I've lo- why not pass it on to the consumer? If I bought I'm a 3D my- printer and milling machine from eBay. Oh, for, really? Yeah, for a hundred dollars. And now <laughs> my crowns cost two cents to manufacture. New each. Year's resolution, I'm printing my own aligners, John. Yeah, I use <laughs> I use Play-Doh to make models, but oh, I did it man. myself, Wes, and it only took me six hours per crown. So oh, man. So We're you know you think about no, what's gonna happen with fees, and you know, everybody gets nervous when you start talking about that because they think what? They think if I raise my fees, 
I'm right. going to lose. Nobody's going to come into my patience. practice. Yeah, patients are going to go somewhere else. Action. So I will tell you what uh, McGill and Hill, who most people in dentistry have heard of, if you haven't, you're, it's worth checking them out. They're uh-huh. one, of the, one of the premier dental accounting and practice management firms that's been around a long time. Mm. And they have a great newsletter, which if you're not subscribed to it, you probably should be checking you know, it I'm out. I'm and I need to. Yeah, dude, you need to get on that. Because every single month, they... Pr- now, I will say, if you subscribe to it for a while, you do see some repetitive things, but it's good reminders usually of stuff that you should be thinking about. But every year, they have a thing where they recommend what they think you should consider doing to your fees. And they base it on consumer price index, how far they think inflation's changing, and also just kind of what their forecast is for the next year in dentistry as far as wages, stuff like that, lab costs. And they are saying a higher fee increase this year. They are recommending 4% across the board. They usually recommend 3%, but they're recommending 4% because they feel there'll be an upward wage pressure, they say. And, uh, and because the consumer price index is moving up, they're recommending 4% across the board. So that's what we're going to do. So, I mean, honestly, though, do you just go into your practice management software and just say, increase everything by 4%? So it's an interesting question. How do you, Be- how do, you do that, John? Well, it, it's an interesting question because what I used to do before I got it better was I would, uh, I would do something like that, not really knowing. A few years ago, and I think you've done the same thing. We had some. Uh, we had uh, Charles Blair, who's a big insurance coding guru, come in and look at all of our fees. And and what we do, kind of boil it down. And maybe we should have an episode about this sometime. But um, boil it down to every probably three years, I'll actually have Charles Blair come in, look at my fees, make sure everything is in line, like that I'm in the right percentile overall. And it's not expensive to have him do that. It's no. less than a thousand bucks, it, isn't it? Exactly. It doesn't cost a lot. And you actually get a personal consultation with him on the phone talking about your practice, talking about the future, talking about insurance, coding, stuff like that, new new stuff. It's well worth it, well worth the cost. And then what I'll do in the interim years is I will just do an across the board percentage raise. Now, there are some times where I'll make changes to that if there's something specific that happens with the lab fee change or a cost change where I feel like I don't have to raise it that much or I need to raise it more. Um, but really... And truly, I do. And you know, that's hard when your crown fee is, say your crown, whatever it is, $1,000, okay? And you're well, going to raise 4% that. 4% is 40 bucks. Right. And you're going to raise that. You start to go, whoa, that's a lot. Is that a big difference? I don't well, know. Well, no. Here's the one that you start noticing it on is like whenever you start like looking at combo procedures, like implants, yeah. let's say it's, you know, let's say it's, you know, uh, $5,000 for implant to crown. Right, right. Including placement, bone graft, the whole bit. Four yep. percent increase. That's yeah. Now you're yeah, talking that's 200 bucks. hundreds. Yeah. Now you're talking yeah, hundreds, hundreds of dollars. Hundreds of bucks. But let me just tell you right now. So before you even told me what you were raising your fees, yeah. You know, I've already we we look at this actually. We I, we start actually look. Darcy, my office manager, starts looking at this in September October before it gets too busy in our practice. We actually have a meeting about <clears> it, <throat> mm-hmm. and um and she's already really done it. Uh, but we we are always. At least three percent um, is where we kind of. That's our gold standard. Like it's three yeah. percent, but this year we're 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 between three and five percent. It's interesting you said four because nice. I haven't read the article. Uh, because some things we went five percent on, some things we went three that we were already kind of feeling like we were up, you know, where we needed to be. Uh, we we look at our overhead mm-hmm. on our procedures. We contact certain people that you really want to contact vendor wise is you really want to contact your high overhead um, companies. Like we contacted our dental lab mm-hmm. and asked them, are they going to be planning on raising fees this year? We contacted our implant uh, company. If you place a significant number of implants that can impact you, uh, your bone grafts, those type things that mm-hmm. ha- are higher overhead procedures um, or things that, and then too, like um, we, you know, if you're purchasing, if you're doing a lot of composite bonding those are high things mm-hmm. that, and then our impression material. We contact those are kind of our main, and we kind of use that as a guide to say if, if they're yeah. raising their tent. Because sometimes, I'll be honest with you, um, I have had companies that have raised their fees by 10 to 15%. And mm-hmm. you might think, well, whoa, that's a, not a, you know, that's, you know, if it's, you know, a $200 overhead and now they raised it 10%. 
you know, that starts to add up yeah, it uh, does. over the year, especially on your higher um, higher procedures. Well, I think, um, bo- so. you know, bottom line here is that everybody needs to look at that. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I think we need to have an episode on this. But I think one thing, yeah. you, if you look at the math on this and you look at the effect that this has on your profitability and your mm-hmm. long term value of your practice uh, not raising fees will cost you an incredible amount of money over your practice lifetime. And it oh, really unreal. doesn't result in patients leaving like you might think. It would take a tremendous wow. number of patients to leave to offset the increase in profitability that you get by that. But anyway, that's a whole other discussion. But I'm hey, glad this, to hear that we're kind of on the same page with that. This episode is really pretty it's amazing. Special. We special. had an opportunity to interview Rebecca Bacow. She is a orthodontist and she's a periodontist too, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, dual training. And um, she practices in Seattle. And um, along with um, Greg Kinzer and uh, uh, Jeff Rausch, um, they have really come together. There's other people at Spear too that are working on this. They've really come together to, to, to develop protocols that hopefully at the end of this interview, we'll talk a little bit more about, about what could be the future of learning for orthodontist, periodontist, specialist, and general dentist when it comes to, uh, treating our patients, um, yeah. and you know, the first time we, we heard about Becca Bacow really in depth was when we were at the uh, Warren Treating Dentition. Warren Dentition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Warren Dentition workshop. And Greg Kinzer starts throwing up these pictures of how we could expand Tad arches. Tad expansion, man. Right, with TADS and also with surgical orthodontic, surgically facilitated ortho. And this name keeps showing up on the screen, Rebecca Bacow, orthodontics by Rebecca Bacow, orthodontics by Rebecca Bacow. And we're like, hold on, who is this person? And he said, you know, well, let me tell you about her. She's, you know, she's a young mom, younger mom. She's got young kids at home. So she hasn't been doing a lot of lecturing, but he's, we're trying to get her here. And while we were at Spear Summit, they announced that she's being added to the Spear faculty. So this interview not only is exciting because of what we get to talk about, but it's also exciting because this is a, we, we think is a young kind of up and coming star really in the orthodontic world and also just in the general dentist world, because she is taking Uh, orthodontics to another level and also she's got a passion for treating airway uh, which you will hear uh, uh, come through in this interview because we've been Wes and I as you guys have heard if we talked about on the show is we've been trying to talk a lot about putting together a team of people to be able to treat especially pediatric patients and their airway problems and so we really wanted to pick her brain on on what she was doing with her team and and who do we refer to and how do we figure out where they go first second third and then how does that correspond to the type of orthodontics she's doing? So we think you guys are going to really enjoy hearing from her, and we look forward to uh, talking with you after the episode and give you some of our thoughts and reactions uh, to the interview. So without further ado, here is uh, Rebecca Bacow right after a message from Heritage Investors. This is Justin Goodbrand. Here is today's tip. Now that your year is coming to an end and you can see definitively what your total income and total expenses are likely to be, have a last minute conversation with your certified public accountant and your certified financial planner to find out if there's anything advantageous you can accomplish in the last week of the year to help minimize your tax liabilities. That way there are no surprises in April. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak to a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is an investment advisor representative of Heritage Investors, a registered investment advisor. Visit heritageinvestor.com or financiallysimple.com for additional information. Well, welcome back to The Dental Guys, and we're again live from Spear Summit out in Scottsdale at the Fairmont Princess. It's been a great day, this initial day, and we have uh, someone real special with us. This is somebody we've been really excited to talk to since we kind of heard about her. Dr. Rebecca Bacow is a dual-trained orthodontist and periodontist, um, and one of the, probably the few in the country, I would say, that's dual-trained uh, in, in those two specialties. And grew up in Seattle um, and uh, went to uh, Haverford, played a lot of sports. I thought that was interesting. Soccer, squash, tennis, cross country, and track. Um, went to University of, of Washington for dental school. And 
you know, the thing that got us kind of uh, familiar with you, and I mentioned this to you when we were talking before, was when we took Warren Dentition, um, Greg uh, kind of unfairly put up some cases showing some of the stuff you guys were doing together. And he said, you know, we really would love to get her uh, down here uh, to do more education because she's busy and she's got a practice, she's got a family, um, there's a lot going on. But just a few minutes ago, and we kind of feel like we have the exclusive yeah this is the scoop deal on this yeah, yeah. that they just announced that you're going to be a part of the resident a part of the faculty here at Spear congratulations that is awesome thank you it's a true honor and privilege yeah, yeah. so tell us a little bit about what you're going to be teaching here at Spear Education so uh, I'll be part of the aesthetic dilemma seminar so we'll be looking at difficult aesthetic dilemmas that we might encounter in our practice and I'll be focusing on the orthodontist role awesome very good. Exciting. Very good. Well, I want to jump right into um, some of the things that we've kind of been dying to ask you about because we know that you have a lot of knowledge about um, airway, especially in pediatric patients, but also in adult patients. And facial growth is something that is one of your areas of expertise. Um, one of the biggest things that we have struggled with personally in our practices, and I think when the more airway uh, training that you take, the more you start wondering, well, that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to properly uh, diagnose, uh, not that we're necessarily diagnosing you know, sleep apnea, but just to go through screening process treatment and go planning. through treatment planning and, and interdisciplinary work. And you know, the ADA just had a, a big conference about a, a practical conference on children's airway health. And the big question that Wes and I, I guess, had uh, coming out of that, well, in the end, who is responsible? Who should be responsible for evaluating airway in children? You know, is it the general dentist? Is it the orthodontist? Is it the pediatrician? Uh, you know, who, who in the end should be leading the charge? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I think, I think we all need to take responsibility for these patients. And I think it's the first person that recognizes that there's a problem. So um, some of the cases that have been referred to me, sometimes the, the general dentist has a sense that there's something going on, but they might not be comfortable spearheading the treatment. And so they'll say, well, this, this six-year-old is grinding. Do you mind taking a look? Or this eight-year-old's still wetting the bed, and I don't know what to tell the parents. Um, sometimes um, they send them to me because they have a crossbite, and then I'm the one that starts asking the different questions and so it's kind of whoever sees the problem at the at the to begin with now I'm also starting to get some more patients straight from the sleep medicine team because adenoids and tonsils have come out and they still aren't getting better and so they're looking for more help but but in general a lot of times I'm the first person, at least in my community, that is identifying these problems. I think as more and more people become educated, I think that might not be the case. Hmm. So as physicians um, are saying that they're starting to recognize that there are some sleep disordered breathing problems in children, and that leads to uh, poor nasal breathing, um, mouth breathing, and the tongue drops down, development stops of the palate, um, and they're, they're starting to snore, allergies are getting worse, and you know, they, they do the best they can. Now, medicine has certain bounds of time that they can spend with a patient, and that's, that's hard, and they're asking for our help. They've recognized that, hey, dentists can be a help, and so, you know, more and more we're hearing, like, can you all help us identify this and send it to the right people? And I think one thing that John and I have really had trouble with is like, well, who does it go to next? Mm -hmm. Like we, you know, we ask simple questions. And like you said, we identify problems and bedwetting is one of those. Mm -hmm. And when you tell a pa parent that your child shouldn't be wetting the bed and they're snoring and they're restless in their sleep and they tossing and turning like Jeff Roush talks about a lot, and we think you need to see the orthodontist, they're like, huh? And so that, that's a tough conversation to have. Right, right, because I think that there's kind of two parts of this. I mean, and you, you, you said, you know, a moment ago that there are time constraints, you know, for physicians. And I think it's a cop-out. 
you know i think that the that's maybe not necessarily like they've put those time constraints mm. on themselves or maybe the reimbursement's not where it needs to be but i guess the, the question is you know it, assuming that the physician's not doing it like i guess we're just, mm -hmm. we just assume the physician's not doing it and it comes to the the general dentist's office do you feel that the next step should be orthodontic evaluation uh, or ENT, um, which do you feel is the pathway that you usually recommend that a, a patient would take? Uh, I do them all at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So patient will be in my practice, bimax or uh, collapsed. We're gonna need upper and lower expansion. Tonsils and adenoids are there. They have a tongue tie. They're sometimes, I'm the first person to recognize it, so I might send them for a sleep study which they probably need before they get adenoids and tonsils out. Right. We get adenoids and tonsils out. We do our expansion. And the thing that you should, so the one thing that has a very specific order is myofunctional therapy and tongue tie release. Mm. And so there, there's a few reasons why the order is very s important. So I want to do my expansion first, upper and lower, because I need to create more space for the tongue. Um, there's a lot of appliances in the mouth at this time as well. And so we want to do myofunctional therapy when the appliances come out mm -hmm. because we have to teach this young patient how to now utilize all this space that they've never had before. Once they've learned the exercises, then we do the release. And the first 48 hours is critical because we want to make sure that they continue to do those exercises even when it's sore. And that's when we prevent the reattachment because I've seen plenty that reattach. Hmm. Um, and this is a problem that we've had communication wise with our ENTs because sometimes the ENT will say, well, the patient's under, so let's just do adenoids, tonsils, and tongue tie release all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we have to kind of put the brakes on them and say, no, 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 let's wait until we expand. Let's wait till we do myofunctional therapy. Um, and then we want to do it after. Similarly for orthognathic cases, let's say it's a retronathic mandible narrow maxilla and they're tongue tied. We want to create that space in the oral cavity to then use the tongue. So we want to do tongue tie release malfunctional therapy after jaw surgery, mm -hmm. or else we run the risk of it collapsing back into the throat. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty specific uh, protocol and I love that. And I think that that is, you know, kind of what we talked to you again about before that's what we're missing. the show is you've just, pretty much laid it out right there right and yet that is not well known that i mean would you agree that that protocol that you just laid out is not well known where is that being taught it's just something my team and i developed right so you know to answer some of you so maybe what you know we have our interdisciplinary teams we have our in dentistry right we have our periodontists we have our endodontist our surgeon our our restorative dentist we have our study clubs and so maybe we need to locally have our airway study clubs. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right. We have our ENT, our sleep physicians, our orthognathic surgeons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's that is the the next step. And and <laughs> we, we just have we, to go there. We have to go there. So now. we <laughs> decided about uh, nine months ago that we needed to do that. And so we started recruit trying to recruit uh, those people. And now, long story short, because we don't want to talk about us as much as we wanted to find out what you're doing. But we now have, you know, a pediatric ENT, a pediatric sleep physician, two pediatric dentists, uh, an orthodontist who gets it, um, not an orthognathic surgeon yet on the team, but we're looking for somebody that can be. And we and so we completely agree that that's don't the forget, next step. You got the one. And a myofunctional therapist. And CBCT. Well, and, a, yes, and an oral maxifacial radiologist. So nice. we're, we're, we're building, we're trying to build that because we do see, but even with all those people, I, I, like you can put all those people in a room and then what happens? We all come to in the room. We're like, so what do we do? Right. And how I does this go? And everybody kind of is like, well, they, do, this person knows a part of it. This person knows a part of it. And we're trying to read literature together. But in the end, I feel like there's a great need for protocols, protocol systems. to be put together. That's literature based. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That is workable where everybody understands what the other person is supposed to be doing because you know, in dentistry, we do have that with endo and perio, and we right. kind of know if you come to Spear Education, you know how to go through EFSB, how to treatment plan a case. But I feel like we need a, a treatment plan protocol for these patients, and it sounds like that's something you guys ha are developing, and I'm, I hope that that becomes a part even more of what's happening with the curriculum here, because I feel like it's it's definitely needed. Um, so so moving on because we could get that that's so, so good but yeah, I, so yeah good. i'll let you i'll let you go on to the well, next I, I think the thing 
now that we've established that we have to know something. Okay, now I'm going to tell you my experience with pediatrics and my practice because I have a family general practice is that it used to be a happy visit around two or three years old. Now a happy visit consisted of the patient just, you know, in mom's arms, laying back, you're going to make him cry maybe, you can just take a quick peek, count the teeth, check for cavities, are they mom brushing, some brushing education. I didn't even charge for that, okay? That was 15 years ago. Now, I charge for a pediatric exam because I'm spending 30 minutes mm -hmm. going through these things. Now, tell me a little bit about what our pediatric exam should look like for a first dental visit or any dental visit for a pediatric. And really, I want you to concentrate on birth to seven because we know those are the crucial times. Well, I, you know, we mentioned the, the, there are some very standard pediatric airway questionnaires um, that are research-based and they're really going to start to identify some of these patients very early on and so um, just having those patients fill out those or the, having the parent fill out those questionnaires um, it really starts the conversation mm. and and I think that's really the key is because once you start asking parents it's sometimes the floodgates open mm -hmm. um, I've had some very tearful parents you know yes. and and once, what's really powerful is when you start talking to them and you start to offer them a solution. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden they feel like all of these things that they've noticed with their child that they couldn't explain, the difficulty paying attention, mm -hmm. the inability to sleep through the night. Um, I mean, I can tell you so many stories oh, yeah. of, of kiddos that we've helped out in the practice because we're the first person to put a name to something that they've seen as a collective issue that maybe their pediatrician never identified before. Yep. So the questionnaire and the health history, I think, is where it starts. Um, things we can look for clinically, um, adenoids, well, we can't see adenoids, but tonsils, and asking questions about things like snoring, bedwetting, looking for abnormal wear. A kid that's grinding is not a, some, a finding you would typically see. We have to look for tongue ties. Um, look for for narrow arches, look for underbites. And also, a lot of these issues are hereditary. So a lot of the patients in our practice, the young ones, are actually the, the children of some of the adults that are referred to us. Mm -hmm. um, because And sometimes the adults will even delay their treatment because they want to focus on getting their kids because with the timing with kids is so critical. Mm -hmm. um, so, gotcha. And I think that that kind of goes on to, so if we identify um, that there's a problem. You know, one of the, the controversial things that's come up in our study club has been the use of CBCT because obviously it has a tremendous value in certain situations for airway evaluation as well as growth evaluation. Where do you see CBCT in, in pediatric cases? Like at what point do you get value from that where the whole Alara principle, it starts to make sense in, in these cases? Great question. So I ask myself when I'm ordering a CBCT, will it change my diagnosis and treatment plan? So for example, if I know I'm gonna expand both arches, I, I, I don't need it. Um, if, if I have a, but conversely, let's say I have a patient where I suspect based on the health history that they have really big adenoids. Sometimes the ENTs in my, in my area, they won't scope. And so if I can show them on the CBCT, look, these adenoids are so big, mm. uh, then it becomes an easy adenoid removal. And so for and, um, a kiddo with joint pain, I wanna know what's happening with the joints. Um, some of the problems with CBCTs is that it's very much posturally driven. Mm -hmm. And so if, there, if you catch this child or an adult at a different position where their tongue is, and we do have some standardized ways that we're supposed to take CBCTs based on the literature, but um, there's no real standard in terms of what's the uh, area of the, of the airway. So I don't hang my hat on a CBCT. For the most part, I know that a kiddo has an airway issue before I see a CBCT. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, I do it more for adults if I'm doing things like TAD expanders because I have to see the the depth and the the length of the palatal bone, mm -hmm. um, or if I have an impacted tooth, there's 
there's value for sure in a CBCT, but I don't need it all the time. Yeah, so it sounds like it's if you need, if you need, if you see the need for surgery potentially, or you or you feel that uh, there's something that's not as, as easy to see for an ENT, it sounds like it's more of a tool for the ENT than it is a tool for you with pediatric patients. Because yeah. again, you can't hang your hat necessarily on dimensions of the airway, especially in pediatric patients. I think there seems to be more literature support for that maybe in adults that there are some dimensions we can look at uh but uh, i i think that's a struggle we've had is just figuring out when, when is, is it necessary when is it necessary because it it does show you things that allow you to uh, maybe educate and i think that that's something that there's a but you know just for education's sake is it worth taking that x-ray um so that's a, that's a great answer yeah i think it's great and here's here i want to kind of jump to something we were talking about on the plane is let's say we've missed it We've misdiagnosed or just not even seen it, and now our eyes are open to what we know now, okay? Kind of like Frank's lecture. And this patient's between, they're an adult woman at, let's just say, 13 to 18 now, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to treat them like an adult. Right. I think one of the things that is interesting about your training is you're perio and orthodontically trained. So you respect... Um, teeth in the bone trough yes mm -hmm. and I feel like that at 13 we're kind of limited speak to that about what we can do and now the conversations with our patients are changing because of this yeah. and now you're gonna tell somebody hey I can't really do this without you having surgery and if we don't do this um, what do you say you know if they say no I'm not going to do that do you treat them because of what it could cause. You yeah, know? great question. Um, I think part of, part of our responsibility as clinicians is to educate and to let the patients decide. And so um, there's kind of two questions there. So mm -hmm. first, first question I'll address is, if, if I know that surgery is gonna be the best route to getting a patient healthy, or the best route at, at addressing their chief concern, uh, I'll tell them. I offer surgery to probably half of the patients I see on a daily basis. Um, if the patient decides that that's not the right option for them, at least I've educated them and given them their choice. The last thing, I, I don't ever want a patient to come back and say, I wish you had told me that was an option. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, however, with TADS and bone plates today, we can do an awful lot for a 13-year-old, and that's pretty exciting. So. If it's a transverse only issue, we can do TAD expanders today. And we have a lot of different designs and extreme predictability in that age group. And we're seeing great results in, I've, I've actually been able to split the palate in two different 60 year old females, which has been transformative for those patients from mm. an airway perspective and gets me to a better place where I can dentally and orthodontically treat them. But we're seeing, but certainly success in 35 and younger. Mm -hmm. Um, if there's a class three malocclusion, we can use TAD expanders or bone plates and a protraction face mask and actually bring that maxilla forward. If it's a true clockwise skeletal growth pattern, that's double jaw surgery. Mm -hmm. um, gummy smile, open bite, those are more difficult to address um, at that age group. So if a patient would doesn't want to go through more extensive treatment, whatever that might mean. Do you feel comfortable expanding by just trying to create a more aesthetic uh, appearance with a patient like that, even given the risk of, say, pushing teeth out or of relapse bone, too, because or, these patients right. do have airway issues, right? Or, I mean, is or that tongue issues? Is that something so, we should just say no? We we won't do it. Um, because sometimes at, no is the best treatment option for a... Yeah, yeah. so right. at the end of the day, we have to do no harm. And mm -hmm. so there will be times where I'll leave a patient in posterior crossbite mm -hmm. and just line up the front teeth because at that time in their life, they're not ready to take it to the next level. Yeah. Um, and that's fine. As long as they know that they have another option, yep. I'm not going to put the teeth into a precarious position and create instability and recession there's no need for that mm. um, and there are certainly cases where I'll look and say if it's it's either surgery or nothing mm -hmm. is there any 
literature that you can support the fact that we have, what we know now is that if we move teeth in a fashion that moves them through the bone on the buccal plate, and what's the risk factor? So there is some literature that will that says uh, that we can cause root resorption, mm-hmm. and some of the ri- literature is actually starting to say that our former literature looked at root resorption, looked at two-dimensional X-rays, mm-hmm. and so now that we have more cone beam data, we can see that a lot of those cases were pushing the tooth out of the cortical plate. Right. And so, not only can we cause recession and instability, but we can also cause root resorption. Mm. Do you think that, you know? It, when we talk, we used to get started talking about this. We we feel, and maybe maybe it's not true, but we feel like there's resistance in the orthodontic community to this discussion. And and uh, well, you know, Jeff, I'll just, I'll Jeff just says it right. And I'll just speak candidly that I feel like there's a a fear that they're going to lose business because they're going to talk about surgery, and patients are going to say you're crazy. I'm going down the road to this other person who won't talk about surgery. Do you think that that's a reason why this is not as maybe that there is resistance or do you think it's more just a lack of knowledge that's the problem? Um, It's probably community dependent, but I do think that some of the concepts that we talk about here at Spear maybe are contrary to the classic orthodontic training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of extractions that are still taught in school. To so, so, so for example, um, going back to your question, let's say you have a patient that's 13, mandibular retronathic with an overbite. And let's say if we look at some of our facial norms, that the front teeth are in the perfect position relative to the face. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. But their lower jaw is deficient. So do we take out two upper buys and bring the upper teeth back? to get a perfect class one occlusion. Well, so let's let's think about this. If our, if our goal is to get the teeth to fit together, that's your treatment plan. If the goal is to preserve facial aesthetics, or if our goal is airway, it's jaw surgery. But how many parents of a 15 year old are really gonna wanna talk about a mandibular advancement? So then it becomes uh, upon us as clinicians to educate the parents and say, look, show them that photo and it all comes down to how we present things Mm -hmm. Um, your upper teeth are in a beautiful place it's the lower jaw that didn't grow properly and so sometimes we just line up top and bottom teeth we give them a night guard and we let them grow and we say if you want jaw surgery when you're 20 30 Mm -hmm. we can always do it later mandibular advancements very predictable Mm -hmm. Um, but but we're not going to grow the mandible in a 15 year old that's right. good. And I think that that is, you know, I think that message is, is, it's very clear that that's what we should be doing. I just, it's such a challenge in, in real world settings for, I think, especially for general dentists who are hearing that and, and looking for an orthodontist who, you know, I mean, we feel oftentimes like we are having to have this conversation with the patient about orthodontic surgery because the orthodontist is concerned about that, that, that this is going to freak out the parents. And, I've, and I, I think it's something, that, you know, when you, when you were, as a, if you're a general dentist, a lot of our listeners are, um, and you're looking for an orthodontist, what are some of the, how do you approach this with somebody? Like, what are the things that you want somebody to ask you or, or to look for in an orthodontist who would want to be a part of, of a team that would, would understand this kind of treatment? Well, I think with any member of an interdisciplinary team, you want to make sure that you have similar philosophies, similar goals, that that you're looking for similar outcomes. And it's really helpful to be having a lot of these same conversations in the exams. So, you know, if you're if you're going to be talking about airway with your patients, then when you refer them over to to us, we want to make sure that we're it's part of a continuum. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's actually really that makes it really fun. Too, yes. because when the patient comes to to our practice, it they feel very cared for, they feel very loved, and I can look the patient and I say, I know this is what your doctor, I know this is what your dentist, it, it, you know, we we've already talked, even though sometimes we haven't, but I know exactly what they're thinking yes. about. Yes. And so, um, just 
a lot of communication. I think that comes from study clubs a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you're spending time with these people. You've had similar education and background. Um, and so if you're reaching out to a new community member, maybe take them, either have lunch with them or, or meet with them after work, look at some cases and, and talk about and say, you know, if you see a patient with an overbite like this, I, I, I want us to talk about it before we decide to take out upper buys and retract the upper teeth. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something else going on. Gotcha. I think that this, you know, John, you and I are super geeked out about this particular subject because yeah. we really live it and breathe it right now. And so we thank you so much because we want to be respectful of your time. I know you've got an engagement after this. So um, I really thank you so much for what you're going to be doing here mm -hmm. in the future as a faculty member, which that is amazing. We're yeah, super excited about that. Very excited about that. And um, we are so glad you came on to talk to us because it just gets our, I mean, there's so many more things that we can I know, can talk we about. could talk for a while, but, we but we'll have to come back and take yeah. your stuff here at Spear. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for just for coming on and talking with us. And I know our listeners will be excited to hear from you. And uh, if you're listening to this now and you have any questions that you want us to talk about again on the show coming up or for tomorrow when we're going to have some amazing uh, guests on as well, make sure that you engage with us on Facebook. Of course, check out Spear's Facebook page as well, which is going to have a lot of the live stream stuff that we've been recording. Uh, you know, of course, this show, it's going to be coming out down the road, uh, but we want you to know that we want you to come back and tell us what you liked about this. Tell us what you want to hear more on The Dental Guys. Wes, it's been a great show. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Bacham. You. Mm -hmm. John, a great interview uh, with uh, Rebecca Bacow. I'll tell you one thing that we really didn't want to talk about was, you know, but it just had to happen, but we were not wanting to talk about what we've been trying to do right? with this airway uh, team that we, we've tried to establish here in, in, our, in our area. And really the whole thing stemmed from like, how do we refer and who do we refer to and what's the sequence of events? But, and we shared with her what we were trying to do and she was super excited about that. But really, I think the message behind this whole interview, because you get excited about this and you want to know more, mm -hmm. and we want to know more, and we want to train our team. We want to train the people that we're working with. We we are not ENTs. We're not orthodontists. We're kind of like the quarterback that sees this stuff, and right. then we kind of like pass it out. And how you right. do that matters. Now, how you get trained to know how to pass it on and to direct right. it, because where do you get that, John? What did she say? Yeah, and she said there isn't anywhere. There isn't she said, anywhere. We're, we're trying so to figure it out. Do you just and that's read, all she could say is like, out now? right. I mean, so she pretty much said there's at the university level, you know, they've got people who've got teams. You know, you think about that with like cleft palate. Do you think about mm -hmm. that with, with and with it say at Stanford, you know, they've got an airway team. They understand all this. They've got all these people. But in private practice, there's really no place that is like a, a prototype for this outside of probably what she's doing and even what she is doing. And maybe we're wrong. Maybe there are other places that have these. If, if you got one, please let us know because we're looking for that uh, feedback from other people trying to do this. But she pretty much said, look, we're, we're figuring this out. And the great thing about that is, is that she is coming to Spear because right. now, you know, if there's a place that you can go that is talking about this, Jeff Rouse is at the, one of the people at the forefront of it. Greg Kinzer, of course, as well, developers of Seattle Protocol. And she's the one actually doing it in real life every day. Mm -hmm. So we hope that what this will do is elevate the game, not only of uh, the Spear uh, education side of things, but also allow for maybe more protocol based treatment versus, you know, just kind of people flying by the seat of their pants. But I like how she went through kind of their protocol as far as who usually see the patient first, second, third, you know, how they deal with CTs. Uh, and, and, but you know, the thing Wes, that I guess struck me the most here, because here she is orthodontist, you know, is, is the fact that orthodontists don't have a lot of places to go for training. I mean, at least we can go out to a place like Spear or Dawson or Panky or, you know, um, uh, Coise, and we can get, you know, a, a, kind of a, a, the most up-to-date, sort of peer-reviewed, uh, right. you know, a curated education. 
Yeah, but let me ask you this. Orthodontists don't really have places like that from what I'm, they what don't. I'm hearing. They don't, and you just took your orthodontist a few months ago mm -hmm. to an airway prosthodontics lecture. Mm -hmm. And his response, we talked a little bit about that prior to, but as this is marinated in his mind, have you had any more conversations about how he was received and yeah. what his involvement in this should be. What what was what's your thoughts? Yeah, on that? And, and that was we. So there were a couple over there, were actually several other orthodontists at that meeting, and so they kind of it was interesting. They kind of talked all together, mm. and they sort of talked about how challenging this was to them in terms of their practice, uh, thinking of how they're going to implement this in their practice and how it's going to change the way they talk to patients. And I think. Now the question is, how does he go back? And this is where we've talked more is we're, we're going to get together and have dinner with uh, me and a couple of the other people that went out to the seminar with him and really hash out how's, what's the logistics of this need to look like? That's right. You know, and, and who, who sees the patient first and who sees him second? And, you know, when do we start treatment and when do we, you know, stop treatment? Uh, and when do we go to the next step with treatment? And so, yeah, there's a lot of fleshing out of that that really we're just getting into with that group closer to me. And then, of course, with the group that I've been involved with with you, we're a lot further along in that process, but we're still still figuring it out. And I think that right. I'm just I'm very encouraged, though, that there's now I'm hoping I'm hoping that with her coming on board at Spear, that it's not just general dentists that are going to have their education brought to another level about this. But I'm hoping that maybe a place like Spear can become more of a center for specialist education. I know they're starting to roll out some interesting seminars mm -hmm. about specialty uh, education to how to have a better you know, endo practice. I think they have one on endo, they have one on mm -hmm. perio. Mm -hmm. And I hope that this kind of stuff with, with her coming on board is, is where they can go out and not just get like practice-based, like practice management type of stuff, but really like elevate their clinical skills and be able to work with referring dentists who have this kind of knowledge that they're trying to get their specialist to be on the same page with, that's a, that's a, that's a hope for me. I hope that it happens. Um, we have a real problem in dentistry and it's uh, sleep disordered breathing mm -hmm. and it's affecting our dentistry, whether you like it or not. And if you, if you, once you see it, you can't really ignore it anymore yeah. Uh, once you understand um, the development of the head and neck a little better and how that the airway and all that is affected by what we recognize as uh, just the oral cavity, um, once, you, once you see these things, you start asking, well, what can we do? And, right. then, and then you reach your a point where you have to have um, a, a source to talk to. Now, here's the interesting thing, John. What we've just talked about has medicine involved in it. Mm -hmm. And and this is why dentists are really just kind of brushing it to the side a little bit, I feel like. Because, John, you and I have talked about this because we both have now had a good amount of experience with treating sleep disorder breathing uh, problems such as uh, obstructive sleep apnea with oral appliances and making referrals for CPAPs. And with medicine, treatment is not not definitive. It's right. not at all um, a drill this out and put this in and you're done and it's right. fixed. Right. It is very different. And as dentists, you have to understand that treatment is sometimes therapy mm -hmm. and therapy is not definitively fixing it. You right. know, it is a time-based medical problem, and that's what's, that's what's going on here. And so, like, John, you have patients right now, and I do too, that they want to get better like that. Right. And medicine And a lot of not, the things that we do in dentistry, that is how it works. You know, that's we how can it works. Say so the mind is, is, is really changed, and I feel great about what Spear uh, Education has done here is they have really kind of just said, we're going to break down the barrier between dentists and physicians, general dentist and specialist, and we want to bring everybody together to help solve a problem. That's what the American Dental Association wants. It's what the American yeah. Academy of uh, Sleep Medicine wants um, to some extent. The American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine wants this. 
Um, but we we really are excited about this, and we're going to yeah, keep and, you guys and even if, in tune. But what's going on? But even if you don't, even if you don't get involved, because I want to I want to also say too, even if you don't get involved in in airway and sleep sort of breathing, if it's something that you know is not for you right now, or you're just going to refer that, that's fine. Yeah, that's but, fine. But I think the thing with this interview with with Becca is, you know, she the orthodontics she's doing, man. I mean, just the mechanics oh, that she's using, using TADS, understanding how orthognathic needs to work, understanding the connection between orthognathic and airway, pediatrics, how that develops into orthognathic problems. Um, hey, this hey, is I, the I, kind of person that I want more of, Wes. I want somebody who, when they my patient walks into her office after I've talked to them about surgery, yes, they go over there and the orthodontist is like, yes, you need surgery. Now, if you don't want to do surgery, that's fine. Right. But the only way we're going to get an adequate result is surgery. And I'm completely comfortable telling you that. And I know Why? what it means and how it works. I mean, that's Why what we need more it? of. We started this spear journey several years ago. And ever since then, we've been involving orthodontists more in our practice, more yep. than ever. For sure. And you know, that's awesome. Because yeah. people are getting treated better and more conservatively, oh, yeah. and I am I'm I'm excited. Yeah, it pumps me up. And even when it they say no, up. it's all about what I still remember. You so, know, from years ago, Gary DeWood. You know, if they say no to orthodontics, what you have to say is, well, if you're saying no to orthodontics, what are you saying yes to? And I just right. that's stuck in my mind that you know, saying no to braces usually means you're saying yes to usually a more compromised treatment, more and that's okay. Treatment. As mm -hmm. long as you are offering that, but you can't offer that orthodontics mm -hmm. if your orthodontist doesn't know what the heck they're doing. Yeah. So that's why yeah. we feel so, you know, happy that you're that they've got this kind of training going on. Wow, so this is great for, yeah, for the entire stuff. dental community and for our patients. We're super excited. We're excited to have Rebecca back on to talk about more of these protocols. And so, hey, listen, if you're liking some of this. Uh, rich content hey send us a little message you know many yeah. of you've uh, sent us messages over the last few months about like man this is amazing we'll keep bringing you good content as long as you let us know hey we really like that keep doing that i had some ideas that were given to me by a student at oregon um, shout out to you you know who you are and uh, we're going to be working on that content maybe something for next year and uh, listen if you're we really need you to go out and go to iTunes right now, Apple Podcast, and give us a five-star rating yeah, and tell definitely. others why you listen to The Dental Guys. It really helps us out. That's the way we grow this show. We grow it organically. Uh, we don't pay um, for reviews, and we need you guys to like us on Facebook. We're approaching that thousand like mark, and we want to see it go over that very soon. And then also, we're on Instagram now. In 2018, we made the made the call there to, to head right. over to the Instagram Insta. and uh, you'll be seeing us there and then follow us on Twitter too. If whatever way you want to reach us, uh, we're going to try to respond to you. So happy new year from uh, the dental guys. And uh, listen, uh, for John, I'm Wes and we are the dental guys.